My name is Dr. Jeffrey Gardier. I'm a board certified clinical psychologist and a uh, associate professor of uh, behavioral medicine at the Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine. Perfect. Okay. So once again, we are faced, parents are faced with having this horrible conversation with their kids about a child, a teenager who was shot by police. A lot of uncomfortable circumstances surrounding this event, but what, just from the ground up, what is that conversation? The conversation is uh, certainly going to be a very difficult one, and it needs to be more than one conversation. Uh, it needs to be a series of talks, finding out what it is that your child or um, a youngster may feel about this particular situation, answering whatever questions they have, uh, trying not to lecture, um, being um, as positive as one can be about talking about the realities of race in America uh, and issues uh, sometimes uh, with police brutality. Um, and it's certainly about not just uh, talking about how to de-escalate a situation, especially if you are a youngster of color, but overall behavior in America in trying to avoid uh, being singled out or being a victim of racism. This is something that is a full-time job for a person of color. Uh, how to, uh, in any way possible, uh, not uh, be at risk uh, for being targeted, uh, sometimes uh, in violent ways uh, and sometimes uh, with regard to uh, implicit or even explicit bias. Is it possible to teach our children not to be afraid of police in light of what's been happening of late as well? I mean, it's whether you shield them from the news or not, it's almost impossible to escape. And is, is it possible to teach young people that um, police can be our, our ally, our friend, our protector? I think it's really important that we not teach our children to fear police uh, because that can have some dire circumstances where if they are approached by a police officer, um, they are so afraid uh, that they may run away uh, or they may not be viewed uh, as cooperating even though they are cooperating. Uh, they, their actions uh, out of fear uh, that they are experiencing may be misinterpreted uh, as um, you know some other kind of behavior, looking too anxious, um, um, you know, looking too fidgety. Uh, that can actually cost a person their life. We saw that happened uh, with the um, with the military uh, individual in Virginia who was afraid to actually move his hands uh, out from outside the car window to take off a seatbelt. And we saw the consequences, uh, the horrific consequences of that particular situation. I think what we need to do is to teach our kids how to respect uh, authority, how to respect police officers, but yet at the same time, uh, be able to discern whether there is a police officer who may not be acting properly, uh, but also how to utilize and how to con uh, uh, how to um, count on a police officer to offer guidance or to offer protection. So you mentioned that it's it is more than one conversation. Obviously, it needs to be an ongoing dialogue. But when when do you tackle that? Is, is, there, is there an age appropriate or event appropriate time to, be, and is this the event appropriate time, again, with a 13 year old being shot, is this the event appropriate time to start that dialogue? I believe it's whether with the 13 year old uh, who was shot, whether it was the killing of George Floyd, uh, whether it was a number of instances of situations gone horribly wrong with regard to police encounters, 
um, that we should be talking to our children, especially our children of color, uh, as to how to just uh, de-escalate a situation or try not to be at risk of a situation of where they're being targeted because of the color of their skin or the type of neighborhood that they're living in. And as I said, it's not just one talk, but a series of talks. And the talks are not just about strategies uh, with regard as to how to behave and not being seen as suspicious, but most importantly, what we as parents, what I do with my own black children, it's about modeling behaviors for them. Um, showing them uh, in my uh, words, but uh, not just my, let me do that again, three, two, one. It's not just about telling them in words, but showing them in my behavior, uh, how to be able to um, navigate through this world, keeping your full pride, keeping your full uh, rights and resources, but doing it in a smart way for someone who may be racist or someone who may be afraid uh, and who is carrying a, a gun and a badge uh, or someone who may have some other kind of issue to not become a victim of that uh, in our society. You know, even when these dialogues may have started with families, um, I think, you know, it, there's no escaping video and news, you, you know, younger and younger kids have phones, they see stuff streaming, there's conversations, they're back at school now to talk amongst themselves. You know, as I said before, it, it's just creating this air of despondency, like what, where are we safe? What is our future? When are they going to stop? You know, is is there ever an endpoint to this? So, what kind? What what do we need to look for in our kids to even know how to gauge this conversation? What kind of reactions should we expect from them, even even before this dialogue begins or continues? Certainly, if we see our kids uh, are being exposed to this kind of news and they're actively. Um, seeking out the information as to what's going on and what's happening in their communities and what's happening to kids who look just like them or having the conversations with other kids. It's not just black children talking to black children, but you know, children talking amongst themselves as to what's going on. We have a very woke society, a very multicultural society who are deploring what's going on uh, with regard to these um, uh, negative uh, police encounters. So as soon as we see that they are curious about it, that they're discussing it, that they want to know more, perhaps there is anxiety on their part, perhaps there's fear on their part, uh, perhaps they may be saying certain things that leads us to believe uh, that they may want to avoid any kind of uh, uh, situation with a police officer, uh, you know, at any point in their lives, that's the time to begin talking with them uh, and giving them information that they need uh, in order to be able to navigate through these types of situations, but also gauging uh, what it is that their emotions are, especially if we're talking around emotions of fear and anger, because those are not healthy emotions for them to have. We want them to feel inclusive. We want them uh, to feel uh, that they are equal citizens. And if they're already experiencing that, and as we see many children of color uh, already feel disaffected, feel that they are not part of the American mainstream. Um, they are beginning to perceive uh, that they are less than or actually even buying into it because of this constant systemic and sometimes outward racism. That's our time to step in and make that intervention, constant interventions as to helping them uh, be able to realize who they are, help them with their dignity, help them with their self-esteem, and help them as far as social IQ as to uh, how to try to avoid these types of situations where they may be victim uh, to some sort of violence. Um, some of that was was really heart-wrenching and, and, and sad to hear. I mean, um, but with George Floyd and this this trial that's playing out now, and you know how we we really 
the, the video is so incredibly graphic. This 13 year old, the video is so incredibly graphic. The army um, uh, personnel that, that you mentioned, you know, we see him being pepper sprayed, pepper sprayed. Again, so very graphic. How blunt do we have to be with our kids to make them understand a that they're they're safe or or you know this doesn't happen to everybody but also b to your point of you know what society is and how we might be forced to, to behave so what is what is the element of truth we need to put out there for them the element of truth that we need to put out to our children is that racism is very real in America. Uh, we are uh, experiencing a time of a rise of white supremacy, uh, that there are many, many dangers out there. Um, racism is not an individual issue. Oh, there are some racist people and some who are not. It's about a structural racism that's been built in to our country and keeps a certain kind of social order. That's the way it's worked and racism has morphed because of that and we're seeing it as part of more institutional racism. And our children of color must understand this in order to be successful. It's not just about reading, writing and arithmetic, but it's also about history and it's also about understanding what are some of the implicit and explicit biases that are out there and that they need to prepare themselves. But it's not just the education of black and brown children, but the education of all children uh, talking about a white privilege, talking about institutional racism, because it affects all of us. And we all must come together multiculturally, uh, different races, um, to be able to work together to make this a more just nation so there'll be equal opportunity for everyone. And that's what the health and wealth of this nation truly is about. We just have not had these conversations. We've been uh, sweeping them under the rug. It's not about shaming anyone. It's about dealing with the reality. And if we don't deal with this reality of racism, then we will continue to see these horrific situations that are happening in the news and happening to individuals and black and brown individuals and others because we are not um, looking at the fact that there are more forces that are in play that in many ways influence and negatively influence perceptions of individuals. Uh, this isn't just about police departments and blaming police departments. It's about looking at our own culture, looking at America, looking at our society. The police just happen to be an arm of that. I'm not excusing what has happened with police officers and the killings of black and brown people and others. What I'm saying is, instead of just focusing on changing the police, we also must focus on changing fundamentally society. And that in, uh, in return will have the trickle down effect, the cascading effect of then changing everything else that is part of our society, including our police departments where they need to get much more training so that they can be part of an intelligent and safer 21st century police force. With regard to Adam Toledo and, and the event there, what do you tell a kid who's scared? This is, uh, I'm just, I'm scared to be out there. What, how, do, how do we deal with that? Well, I think the most important thing that we can tell a child, uh, as we have seen with this um, um, uh, Adam Toledo case, is that it is okay to be scared. Um, certainly as a child, um, that is a very appropriate uh, emotion given what they have seen with that particular case and many other cases of, uh, uh, of abuse or, or potential abuse. Uh, but the bottom line is, if we feed into our own fears, then that only puts us further uh, at risk 
for being victims of violence, whether from police or anyone else. It really is about the empowerment strategies. What are the ways that we can navigate through society in a smarter, more resilient way uh, so that we can be successful? Is there an age appropriate time to have this conversation? The age appropriate time is any time a child is understanding or beginning to want to understand what's going on, uh, that is the age appropriate time to step in. But even with children who may not understand what is happening, now it becomes even more incumbent upon us as parents and as society to teach them much more positive behaviors and to, in many ways, prepare them for a society where they may be treated uh, as less than or as more than, but at the end of the day, it really is about uh, teaching them the tenets of equality, of love, and of respect. Some education for parents too. It's an education that parents need to understand, uh, love, respect, um, um, being able to accept uh, other people who are different from them because we are modeling those behaviors for children. It's not just about the words. It's not about listening to what we do, but actually watching what we do. Just as important, if not more. 